recorder is on, double checking. So we got recording. All right, so I'm, the first thing I'm gonna do is just to check um, how many classes we have remaining because I have to schedule the topics accordingly. <coughs> and the schedule is all the way down here. So it looks like December 9th is the last mm -hmm. class, or it's the well, it's the start time of the last class. So if you want to look at the actual exam schedule, we can go to the college schedule itself. Schedule of classes. Do they have the final schedule on here? It looks like it. I just need to find it right there. Okay. So as far as the final exam is concerned, the first exam is on the 14th. Actually, it says right here on the 11th. So unless we have a dead day, um, so the 9th is the last day that we'll meet. And today is, today is the 30th of November. So if we look at the schedule here, okay, so this is today, today is the sec, oops, uh, today is the 30th, and next month we have the 2nd, the 7th, and the 9th. So we do have four classes, including today we have four classes remaining. So I got to make sure that we cover all of the important topics before the end of the semester. What is the example of this class? Hmm? Final? The final exam is the same as what they usually scheduled. So if you look at the exam, the final exam schedule, this class starts at one o'clock on Monday on Wednesday, Mondays and Wednesdays. So find me the time slot, right? It's Monday, Wednesday, days, Monday, Wednesday, uh, day classes beginning and we are beginning at one o'clock. So the exam time is going to be Monday, December 14th. Is that okay? Yeah. Same classroom, and the time is going to be from 12.45 to 2.45. So the final exam is two hours instead of 75 minutes. But there will be more questions. <laughs> Um, well, when we get to the fi the practice final, we'll you know take a look at that. Two more questions. Two more questions. Yeah, <laughs> something <laughs> like that. You know, Just it's the num it's not the number of questions. It's you know the qu yeah, nature the of the questions, questions. Like already, I feel like take long enough. Mm hmm Like to where like I have to like manage my time on them. You know. Yeah, you 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 always want to manage your time in a final exam or any type of exam. You know, just go through all the questions, find the easier ones to answer first. You know, that's a typical, you know, strategy. Um, we do have a new homework assignment. Um, this is on arrays. Okay, so we'll talk about arrays today. We talk, we have started to talk about arrays, you know, like two weeks ago, and then we got, you know, the uh, exam, and then we got, you know, the other type of stuff happening in between. But this is your new homework assignment. It's called string fragment. Okay, you know, and don't look it up. There's not no such, you know, standard string function in C or C++. So if you, you know, right click on this and look for it, I don't think you will find anything. Uh, there's a string fragment, but it's not related to this particular homework assignment. So it's kind of new, okay? All right, so the instructions is already described here. I'm not gonna go through the details of the instruction, um, but what I would do is to start off with, you know, what your input will look like and what the output is supposed to look like. Your input will have two lines, okay? So your two lines would have, you know, some kind of text can be empty, a single line feed character to mark the end of that line, another line, which can also be empty, and then another line feed to end the second line. So your input file, the standard input file as input has exactly two lines. So the next question is, what do we do with those two lines? First thing is you want to read those characters into arrays of characters. So you will need two arrays of characters to store to store those two lines. When they're stored, okay, you know, I'm just assuming the first array is called soup, 
and then the second array is going to call word because we are looking for letters in the alphabet soup. Okay, I guess it's not funny, but <clears throat> but that's basically what we're doing. Okay, you know, given the word, which is the second string, we want to locate each and every letter of the word in the soup, and we want to find out the indexes of those letters in the soup. I have examples later on. But when you read it, you want to read it into two different arrays. And we are going to observe the C standard, the C string standard, which is basically saying every string is null terminated. Null termination means in order to mark the end of a string, you put a null character or ASCII zero as the last character. So this allows you to have to reserve an array, let's say, of 256 bytes but specify a string that only has three letters because you can then put in A, B, C, okay? So the first element, second element, and the third element will be A, B, C or the ASCII codes of A, B, and C. And then the fourth um, character is going to have the ASCII zero to mark the end of the entire string. Are there any questions about no termination? Yep. Do you even need to put it in there? Could you just go soup two and then start with word zero, word one, word two? Well, you can give it a try. <laughs> okay, but this is based on the concept of arrays. And soup and word are both arrays of characters. So they're char arrays. And so what you so this is an example. Um, we'll basically say let's say the first string or the first line in the input file is tech enjoys programming a lot with a single period okay that's your soup okay this is where you can find the letters the second line is going to be quote unquote the word in this case I want to find the word tar or, or I want to find all the letters all the characters of tar tar so in this case the output of your program is going to be 27 27 turns out to be the index to the lowercase t all the way over there and then the second line of output is 1 because we have a lowercase a over here. It is index 1. And then we have a 12 as the last line of your output because 12 is the index of the first lowercase r in this entire line, which is this r over here. Are there any questions about what your program is supposed to do? do or do you guys want me to give you another example? Another example would be nice. Another example. Okay, so I will use word pad or mouse pad to give us another example. So I'll just type, you know, a regular sentence here. Alpha bad soup tastes good. Okay, that's the first line. And then the second line, I'm just going to look for certain things here. Uh, let's see. You guys can help me out too. You can do this. We have a lot of T's, so we can find something that has multiple T's. So that's good too. Do we have an H in here? Yes, we do. We have two O's. Ah, this is good. Tooth. Okay. All right. So this is a, this is actually a very very good example. Because it also illustrates that you can only use one each letter of the soup exactly once. Okay, so if I'm looking for tooth, there are two T's and two O's, but the first T and the second T cannot come from the same T of the soup, and the same thing applies to the O's. Okay, so let's see what is going to be the output of this particular program. This is the input. So you look at the first letter of the word and you say Okay, where can I find a T in the soup? And the first lowercase t is all the way over here. Okay, so the output, the first number that you're going to output would be the index into this lowercase t of the first line of the input. So that's going to be, this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So this is 7. Okay, are there any questions about why 7 is the first number as the output of this program? Okay, then we have to find the first lowercase o, and the first lowercase o, as you can see, is over here, but we have to output the index into that o, so let's do some counting, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 
So the second line of your output is going to be 10. Now here comes the tricky part. The third letter of tooth is also a lowercase o. But since I have used the o in soup already, soup, the word inside the soup, I have to go look for the second lowercase o, which is all the way over here. Okay, so the index of the second O is going to be the third line of the output. So let me do some counting here as well. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 1, 2, oh. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Oh, I think I lost count. Sorry. Um, let me see. Can I output... I just need a way to line up everything, so I'm going to do this. I can't count. There we go. Okay, that makes it easier. Okay, so this is 22. And then we have to find the second lowercase t. The second lowercase t is going to be this one, because we have used up this one already. So this is going to be 14. And then we have to find the first lowercase h, and that's going to be this guy. It's going to be 3. So the output of your program, this is the input, okay? Two lines to serve as the input. The first line is called the soup. This is where you fish the letters. The second line is called the word, because for each character of the word, you have to find out, okay, where in the soup can I find you know, that particular letter? And the output of your program would be the indexes into uh, the soup so that you can find all those letters. Are there any questions about the input, the output of your program? Yep. So I have to come up with the, with the soup and the word? You can certainly use this as an example. Okay, this is, a, this is a very good test case because I just worked it out for you. So I would certainly use this as a test case. Okay. Yep. What is the program supposed to do if we try to get a letter that's not in that's a very good question. So I'll give you an example of, <coughs> this is the first line, the second line is zebra. Okay, so quite obviously we don't have Z in here. So there will be no output whatsoever if, the, if, <coughs> if at least one of the <coughs> letters of the word cannot be found in the soup, there's no output whatsoever. Okay, are there any questions about the behavior of this program. So you just said that um, if it can't meet one of the characters, or if it can't match one of them, then it won't output anything? Yep, it won't output a single thing. Okay. So there, there will only be some output, or the output of the indexes, if all of the letters can be found. And remember the rule too, you cannot use the same letter twice. Once you use up um, this lowercase t, you cannot use the same lowercase t. So are they case sensitive also? They are case sensitive. Character comparison in C and C++ is case sensitive automatically. Okay. So you will actually have to work harder to make it case insensitive because it is automatically case sensitive. Okay. Any other questions about what your program is supposed to do? Question? Not sure. Not sure about whether you have a question or whether what the program is supposed to do. Yeah, what the program is supposed to do. Okay, maybe I can describe it in a more mathematical way for those of you who are engineering majors. So in the case of, okay. So this is the actual, this is the actual condition, okay. Um, if word has three characters and string fragment returns non-zero, okay, well, I'm skipping a little bit ahead of myself here. Okay, so in order to do the string matching thing, you have to implement a function called exactly strfrag string fragment. It's going to take in three parameters. The first parameter is a is soup. It is a pointer to const char. But a pointer, remember, in C and C++, it's the very same thing as an array. There's really no difference between an array and a pointer. So soup is your first array. Word is your second array. 
of characters, and then you have a third array which is indexes. So the third array is not an array of characters, it is an array of integers, because this is where you store the indexes into the characters. If, and then you look at the return value of this function. Okay, the return value is described here, so let me just highlight it on the projector. <coughs> the return value is zero if and only if there is no match. In other words, if you cannot match at least one letter in the word to the soup, then the return value is going to be zero. The function returns a zero. The function returns something that is non-zero if there is a complete match. Yep. Can you explain what the dereference variable is uh, doing and why it's needed for the um, parameter? Uh, is that a definition? Yeah, a definition. The function definition? Right there? Oh, you right mean there. here? Uh huh. This one? Yeah. Well, let's take a look at the chapter that we are supposed to be reading. Oh, remember, I gave you guys some reading assignment? Uh, it's in there? Okay. Yep, it is in C strings. So if you read uh, C strings, it will give you some idea. So it's the same thing like this one here. It's the same thing like this one here. It explains it in there? Nah, I would say, I would imagine so. Since I wrote this. <laughs> this is one, and then there's also another one too. Um, the implementation of arrays. So I think it is probably described in this one. Yep, it's right here. Basically, when you have something that looks like this, you know, T is just some type, can be int, can be char, can be whatever type you want to use. But whenever you have a pointer, PTR, that is declared as a pointer, that's what the asterisk is, to a type T, it is the same thing as an array. You can use it as an array just like that. Okay, so there's a little bit of reading that you guys have to do prior to the class because you know this is a hybrid class, which means you know part of the lecture is you know is actually reading this material. Um, let me check the first the first one here. This the first document is really just you know capturing you know the concept of arrays from your C uh, from your CISP 300 or 301 class. So in terms of concept, are there any questions about arrays? Yep. Let me see if I got it right. So you need the uh, dereferencer because uh, it's not a, it's not um, it's not really dereference in this case because when you're talking about a type, it is a pointer to. So PTR is a pointer to something. Well, in in the in your homework assignment, there's no P P in there. Um, well, the name is different. It's not PT. It's not named PTR, but it is named soup. And what is the other one? Word. Doesn't it need to say P P in order to be a pointer? Is P a keyword? No. No. Uh, okay. That's just part of the name. So getting back to the homework assignment, if you focus on this parameter here, I'm not sure how it shows on the board. Not very well. Maybe if I magnify it. It, it's a little better here. Okay, so if you look at this parameter, it means soup is a pointer to a character and it's not supposed to change and therefore const. Okay, but every pointer is an array in C and C. Okay, any questions about this part? I think there's an example of how to initialize an array, so this one may be helpful. Yep, go ahead. So in the indices part, we just have to basically make sure that the point of reference does not equal the last character that it was searching for. So like when it actually like gets the number, you don't want it to be the same because then it'll be looking at the same letter. You have to keep track of you know whether something is already used or not. That's okay. That's what I'm saying. Which can be, you can use whatever way you you need whatever way to do this to keep track of you know which letter has been used already. But one thing you cannot use, or one method you cannot use, is to change the array that uh, you cannot change the array soup or the array word because 
they are both declared as cons char, which means you know they are not they cannot be changed. We could just use like you can have your own local array to keep track of stuff too. We could just use like a ternary operator for that, though, couldn't we? Okay, sorry. Like a ternary operator for that. Probably not because you because we don't know how many characters we have in Word. Oh, yeah. yeah, because Word can be short, can be long, can be as long as the soup itself. Okay. 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 All righty. So, given this is your homework assignment, I will give you example programs today. Okay, so you can learn from the example programs, ask questions about the example programs today. So, hopefully, this will be useful. All right, first thing first, let's go ahead and write a program that makes use of a, an, an, that declares an array, and it will do something about it. Okay. <clears throat> we'll just call this array1.cpp, and this is the program. So we have integer i, so i is nothing special at all, but we'll have an array called, oh, I I'll just call this array and we'll give it 50 integers, okay? So this is an array of 50 integers. Um, let me turn on line numbers so this way we can refer to the line here. Okay, can someone tell me what is the purpose of line four? What does it do? see how big the array can be. Okay, it does help decide you know, how big the array is or how many elements are in the array. But this is the declaration of the variable. What is the name of the variable? I or array. Array, exactly. A-R-R-A-Y is the name of the variable. But this is not just one single value. This is a variable that is an array, which has 50 elements. Yep. Array isn't in a reserved word? Array is not a reserved word in C or C++. Okay. <coughs> so what I want to do is I just want to do something simple. I want to initialize this array so that the um, el a particular element of this array will have a value that is twice of its own index. Okay, so the first element having the index of zero is going to have a value of zero. The next element, which has an index of one, is going to have a value of two, and then the next one has a value of four, six. 8 and so on. Okay? And when do I stop? You stop when you reach array um, with the parentheses 49, correct? Okay, 49 is the last is the index of the last element. Very good. Okay. So that means, you know, in order to stay in the loop, I want i to be less than 50. Yeah. Okay? Less than or equal to 49 would work as well. But this is more standard, okay? In C and C++, you know, this is a fairly standard kind of code. And I use a post increment of i at the end of this loop. This is a for loop, which is really nothing more than a um, fancy while loop, okay? So inside the loop, I'm going to do something to initialize the value of each element of array. So I only focus on one element for each iteration. And the element or the index of the element is controlled by local by local variable i. So array bracket i, which refers to index i or the element at index i of this particular array called array, is two times i. Okay. Are there any questions about line eight? The left hand side of line eight designates a particular element in the array. The right-hand side is just a value that we are going to evaluate and assign to that particular element. Any questions about line 8? Okay. So let's go ahead and just run this program <coughs> in GDB. So G++, dash G, dash O, array1, array1.cpp, GDB, array1, this the program. And I'm just going to put a breakpoint on line 10, you know, just run the whole program through. Um, we'll put another breakpoint on line, well, I'll put on line 6 for now. Okay, so we are stopping on line 6. Now, in GDB, you can actually print the entire array, which is not possible in your actual program. But GDB gives you all kinds of help when you're debugging a program, and it will give you something like this. 
you go like holy smoke holy smokes what are we looking at here this is the value of the first element you know which is index zero this is the value of the second element index one and so on why do we have all kinds of gibberish in this in this particular array at this point is that in hexadecimal no these are all decimal numbers when you see negative something it is in decimal okay, okay but why do we have all of these kind of gibberish values because it's not initialized okay very good it's not initialized at this point so if I do a continue, it will go through the entire loop. And now that we are out of the loop, let's go ahead and print the entire array again. And what do we get? Kind of what we expected, right? Because you know this is after the initialization. So the first element, which has an index of 0, 2 times 0 is 0 itself. This is index 1. 1 times 2 is 2, and so on. The last element is 49 times 2, which is 98. So are we doing OK so far in terms of using arrays? Yeah. Oh, so far so good. Very good. OK. <coughs> and then I'll do something, oh, I don't know. Let's do, it, do something with scanf, OK? So I'm going to copy array1.cpp to array2.cpp. So this time, instead of, you know, giving it a particular value. I'm going to change this to only five elements because I don't want to have to type a whole lot. OK, now this is also a good point to tell you guys a trick. Well, not so much a trick. It's more of a best practice. OK, <coughs> you want to control the size of an array using a symbolic name. In other words, it makes more sense for me to declare const int array size and initialize to, let's say, 5 in this case. Then everywhere else that I need to refer to the size or the number of elements in the array, instead of using 5 as a numeric constant, I would just refer to the symbolic name array size over here, and then the same thing array size <coughs> over here. So the question is, why do I do this? I mean, why do I add one more line and then change all those single five digits with array size, which seems to be a lot of typing for no, no good reasons? <coughs> Yep, go ahead. If you ever change the size, you only have to change one place, and it consistently changes it across everything. Yep, exactly. Okay. So the answer is, you know, if I do it this way, if I need to change the array size to 10, <coughs> I only got one place to change, because everything else is referring to the term array size. Um, they will all get changed automatically. Okay, so this is a good programming practice. It's not like it is wrong to refer to 5 as a constant throughout the program. But if you use constants like 5 or 10 or something like that, and you decide to change the actual size of the array, you sometimes you remember to change it at certain places and not other places. So your program would not work consistently anymore. But to use a symbolic name will, will basically help solve the problem. But in this case, I'm going to do something else. Okay, Instead of you know, just assigning a value based on an expression of the index, I'm going to do this. I'm hoping you guys still remember that. Can do you guys still remember this part of scanf? Yeah, reading a decimal. Reading a decimal number into something, right? Okay. So, how about this part here? Can someone tell me what I'm actually doing with this scanf? You're reading the decimal and you're assigning it to uh, a placeholder in array. Like and which element in the array is getting it? Yep. And then it's going to move on until it reaches Yep. Exactly. So this is going to read five integers in decimal, and it will read those integer values into array bracket zero, array bracket one, and so on. So I'm just filling out the uh, filling up the array using the standard input file in this case. Is that okay so far? Okay. So let's go ahead and test this program. I don't think this is going to be a whole lot of fun because it's really the, about the same as the first program except it reads the value from the uh, from the standard input file it complains yeah, scan yeah, yep right. have to do the pound include yeah. okay. well that's why we have compilers okay so now we I'm gonna give it an input file okay so in input file just give it some gibberish 
values. Five of them. Okay. Here we go. GDB um, array two. Oops. List the program. Put a breakpoint on line thirteen. Run the program, redirecting the standard input file from input.txt. Press the enter key. We are out of the loop. Print array. And what do we get? The five numbers in the file. Yep. Uh, for ScanS behavior, uh, it'll try and match as many numbers uh, for a decimal number as on each line. It will try to match as much as possible until it gets to what we call a space. A space can be a line feed, can be a tab, can be a, you know, so form feed. Okay, so if all those numbers were on the same line, you would only have one array entry at index zero. Is that correct? If they are all bunched up, yes. But if they're separated by spaces, then they will still be Isn't considered. Is it different with characters? Yes. It is different for, with, the, with characters. Yeah, that screwed yes. me up on the test. Yes. <laughs> so combining what you observe in these <coughs> programs and what you already know about ScanF with a percent C, you will be able to read the soup and word into different arrays. Yeah, because you basically, with a character, you have to change the array size and then it would read each character individually, correct? Yep. Okay. And you had a, nope, okay. All right, so are there any questions so far with array1.cpp and array2.cpp? So, yeah, does go ahead. scan f um, read spaces? How does it read spaces? Um, with a percent C, it would read spaces just fine. Okay, so how would the output of like a space, like would it consider it a character? Yeah, the space actually has an ASCII code to it. Okay. So when you do a man ASCII, oh, I guess I don't have the ASCII table installed uh, here. Uh. Okay, so the ASCII page that you can look up here, yeah, there's also the space character is 32 in decimal, which is two zero in Hexadecimal. Hexadecimal. So depending on how you wanted the uh, the character to be inputted into the array, it would read a different ASCII code or different of those lines. Well, these are just the ASCII code. These are basically a, is a correspondence between the letter or the character and its ASCII code. This is four two in hexadecimal. Okay, yeah. But the space character, since you know we can't really see a space character. So that's why it's spelled out as SP, but that's basically the space character. Um, the null character, which is what we use to terminate a string, is NUL. It has an ASCII code of zero. Okay. Yep. Do me a favor. Can you go back to the program one more time? I could take a picture of it. Well, it's all getting recorded. I know, but this is my, makes me so I don't have to go through the whole video. But if the whole class asks me to do this, you know, we will never be able to go forward. I'll never do it again. I promise. I don't remember where it is. Uh, it's probably here. Which one do you want? Uh, the second one. Thank you. Okay. Moving on. <clears throat> so I'm hoping that you know with this simple program, you guys can play with it. Instead of reading integers, read characters. Remember, when you read characters, you want to read into an array of characters, not into an array of integers. Okay, so make those changes and you know create your own test file. Okay, and you can stuff all kinds of stuff in your in your text file, right? You can you can stuff you know just regular you know characters, the space character, the line feed character, and see what happens. So. No, when you submit, you just submit your folder with your, your source file, with your CPP file. The same way that you turn in your previous program and all of your other programs. Okay, so you can do the Yep, exactly. So when we test our um, program, we should consider that there might be, the array might, and the input file might have like multiple lines, right? Multiple lines. It, it can only have two lines. Two lines so the first line is soup, is the soup, the alphabet soup. Mm -hmm. The second line is the word. So for each letter in the word, I want to pick out, you know, one piece from the alphabet soup. 
Oh, so okay, so let's say first one is my world rocks, so that would be our soup. And then the second one says math or something like that. The second that would be our word, so we're gonna look for M A P yeah. in the soup. Yes. Okay, that's how we tested it. And well. then your output is would be the indexes into okay. soup of each character in the word. Uh, I th I'm, I'm just thinking about uh, doing this program thing. I'm going to want to try and isolate uh, so that my program knows when it's reached uh, end of line. And so uh, just like your test, if I wanted to uh, create some code to only um, use scanf after a previous scanf had found uh, the first, all the stuff on the first line, uh, it would, when looking for things that aren't characters like A through Z, um, when you're asking uh, a condition for using scanf, are you going to be uh, asking it to see the ASCII code, uh, the ASCII code number? For example, uh, end of line is ASCII code 10. Yes. And so you would ask it to stay in the loop until finding one zero. Well, that's up to you to decide. Yeah. But we are looking, we are looking at line feed as the end of a line. Okay. So that ends the, the soup and starts the word. Yep, go ahead. Um, I'm having a bit of an issue because, like, mine, I have the exact same program written that you just had. The reading I, integer one? Okay. Yeah, array two. Mm -hmm. And when I try and run it in GDD, it just hangs up. Because it's asking you to type in your integers. Oh. So the difference between how you ran yours and mine is I had a redirection and I prepared the test file ahead of time. In your case, you're, in your case it's get, it gets a little tricky because GDB itself wants to use the standard input file so that it can actually enter you know, commands to GDB, like set a breakpoint here, continue, you know, let me print out the, the value of this you know, variable and so on. But at the same time, standard input file is also used by the program being debugged. So that's why it gets a little confusing. And that's why I recommend the use of a, you know, redirecting from an input file. So this way you can prepare the test case and just redirect it. Okay. 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 Yep, go ahead. Um, so in the, uh, the two lines, the alphabet and the soup part, well, we have to compensate for uh, integers or decimals or anything like no, that? No, no, you just, you, you can just kind of blindly go through the soup. Just expecting soup. that we're yeah. going to get characters? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm just writing a tiny little program that can basically answer most of your questions about, but what if there's a space? What if there's a punctuation of some kind? What if there's a line feed? Okay, because what, what do you think this program does? Well, this is well. First of all, this is an infinite loop because it's while one. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't get that part. That's okay. That's that, that's kind of besides the point. Yeah. But the only thing it does that is actually useful is the scanf, right? Because nothing else is, is really doing anything that's interesting. And what it does is it's reading one character at a time into ch. So what you want to do if you want to write your program before you write your own program, you want to test with this particular one. Okay, so I'm just going to recompile this program first, and I'm going to test uh, a particular input file. This looks like a good one. Okay, so we'll just keep it the way it is, and we'll GDB <coughs> read, which is the name of this particular program. Um, put a bright <coughs> one on nine nine. Hmm. Yeah, that'll work. Redirect. You know, when we'll run it and redirect from input.txt. And so now it has stopped before the scanf. And what you want to do is not to single step, because if you single step, it will go into scanf, which will give you a lot of you know, you know, gibberish. So you don't want to do that. What you want to do is to, instead of single stepping, it is, what is the other way to do it? It's not continue. Continue will work as well. But there's one way to step over something. I cannot remember the name of that. Okay, let's say help, and it's running. Okay, next, next, and next. 
Okay, so what next does instead of single stepping is if you are at the point where you're calling a subroutine like scan f or your own subroutine, if you say step, it will step into the subroutine so you, you can debug the subroutine that you're calling. Next, on the other hand, will call the subroutine without stopping in the subroutine. Okay, so if you are going to call a subroutine and you already know the subroutine is going to be okay, then you can use next instead of step. So this way it will just kind of execute the subroutine without stopping inside the subroutine. So that's what I just did. And what I want to do is to say, okay, tell me what I just read. Is the letter, is the digit two. Yep. If you use next while in a subroutine, will it take you to the next line outside of the subroutine? Say that again? If you, what, what happens if you use next while in a subroutine? It will only affect the, f the very next thing that you are about okay. to do. Okay, so now we can uh, next, next, okay, print, what did, what did I just read? It's the digit three, okay, which has an ASCII code of 51 in decimal. Uh, next, next, uh, print CH, this is the last one on the first line, okay, it's the digit four with an ASCII code of 52. So here comes the fun part, because I'm going to read the uh, line fee character. So at this point, I should have read the line fee character, print ch, and guess what I do? What I, what, what, what I, what do I get? N and a slash n, which is end of line. Exactly. So what you can do is you can either compare what the character to just 10 all by itself, or you can compare to quote backslash n quote. They are exactly the same thing. So is I can it always going to print out the ASCII character for you also? Hmm? Is it always going to, if you're dealing scan f for a character, it's going to print out the ASCII code? No, 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 it doesn't print anything. The printing part is only is only done because I'm in GDB and I oh, ask it to. Okay, yeah. Yep. So if I wanted to use uh, scan f to look for specifically the line feed, I wouldn't have to use 10. I could technically use the quote uh, forward slash n quote. You can give it a try. I mean, you know, that's that's. that's uh, I cannot answer every possible yeah. combination of things, but but this is how you specify a character is to use the, a single quote to specify what which character you want to specify. So quote for quote refers to the character for, not the value for. Okay. So uh, this program is going to be helpful because it shows you exactly what ASCII code you are going to get when you read. You know a particular text file, so you can put all kinds of stuff into into a text file. Go through this program and see what it, you know, what ch looks like when you read you know the characters one by one. Okay. Are there any questions up to this point? Okay. If there are no questions about this program up to this point, I am going to copy input two dot txt. Oh, <coughs> array 2.cpp to array 3.cpp and the difference between these two is in array 3 I'm going to pull the logic of reading into the array out of the main subroutine itself so I'm going to make my own subroutine here okay so I just call this and um, well I can make it a void it doesn't return anything particularly useful read integer array that's the name of the subroutine i'll give it two parameters the first parameter is int asterisk um, int array the second one is going to be const int n all right so the intention of this particular subroutine is i want to read from the standard input file into int array as a parameter but once you get here you would have no idea of but how many integers am I supposed to read so I'm going to use parameter n to specify the actual number of elements in the array are we doing okay so far with this approach yes okay all right <clears throat> So in here, I'm going to have the same loop. So I'm going to copy some of my code here. And there are four lines here. I'm going to copy four lines all the way up here. But I have to make some changes. 
For instance, I do not have an i yet, so I'm going to declare my local variable i of read int array. This i is no longer useful because I don't need this loop here anymore. Okay, so what else do I need to change? There's no array size. Because array size is defined as a local variable of main. When I have a local variable, what does it mean when it's a local variable? It's local to local to the current scope. So when you look at the scope of array size, let me turn on the line numbers, and you guys can tell me what is the scope of array size the way it is defined at this point. From line 15 to line 18, OK? So on line 7, can I still refer to array size and have the compiler to figure out the definition of array size? No, cannot. But I have something better, right? So what should I use instead of array size here? Parameter n, exactly. That's the whole purpose of parameter n, is to specify what is the maximum number of elements in this particular array. So I can use that. I don't have array either. What do I have? Int array, very good. All right, that's it. So now I have pulled out the logic to read into an array of integers from main into a um, subroutine, uh, into a function. But what is important here is how I use the, 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 the parameter int array. It is a pointer to an integer, but in here it is used as an, in, as, as an array. Because as I said earlier in class, every pointer in C and C++ can be used as an array. And that's exactly what is happening here. In fact, for those of you who do not like to see the asterisk symbol as a part of the type here and say, hey, this, is, this doesn't say it's an array. I don't like this. Well, fine. Get rid of this and turn it into this. They mean exactly the same thing. There's no difference whatsoever between int asterisk int array as opposed to int int array open and close uh, square brackets. There's no difference whatsoever. What okay. if you did both? Hmm? Say again? What if you did both? Um, well, if you do both, then it, mean it, it changes the meaning of what is int array. So if you do both, like this one here, then int array becomes an array of integer pointers. So it's an array of each space of the array? No, it is an array of pointers. Or you can also say this is a pointer to a pointer. <laughs> <laughs> so for now, we are not going to deal with this. Okay. okay? Yeah. So That's from fine. now, at, at least for now, we just say int array is just a pointer. Or you can say int array is an array of integers, which means they mean exactly the same thing. Yep. So I got this right. When using the asterisk in a parameter for a, uh, a definition, it's a pointer. But using it uh, in lines of code, uh, like int star uh, x equals uh, int star x, that's dereferencing. When you need to refer, to, when you are using it to uh, define a parameter, an so asterisk means it's a pointer to whatever is to the left hand side. And it's a dereferencer when it's in not in a parameter. Well, it means basically the same thing, but when you use it as a value, it, it, it becomes dereference. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? How many people actually read my notes? Okay, very good. So if you have read my notes, you can probably remember that I can also do this instead. <coughs> they also mean exactly the same thing. Okay, so for those of you who have no idea why you know I can add i to a a pointer, and what is the meaning of this? Read the notes, <laughs> okay? Because it is already in the notes, and this is actually very important because this is one of the very few things that makes C C plus plus very different from all the other programming languages. Okay, it is what you can do with the pointers. Okay, but I'm gonna. Change this back to the more conventional way of representing the same thing, which is this. Okay. Are there any questions about this part of the program? 
No questions. So array 2.cpp and then array 3.cpp, which is what you're looking at here, in terms of the behavior of what it does, they are exactly the same. There are no, well, excuse me, there's one thing I left out here. If I just run this program at this point, what, what do you think it's going to do? Come on, you guys can read the program. Look at main. Why would it read anything? Did I call read int array? Yeah. Um, actually, no. <laughs> it's not going to read. Well, okay. This is this is a really stupid program because it declares two variables, right? It declares a constant called array size, then it declares an actual array of five integers, and then it doesn't do a single thing and just say bye bye, right? So I missed one important thing. I forgot to call the subroutine, okay? Read int array is the name of the subroutine. It needs two arguments. The first argument, which is going to fill in int array, what should I use here? What is my array? Your array is... Just the array itself. Yeah. And how many elements am I supposed to read into array? Exactly. Instead of spelling out five as a constant, use the term, use the name, use the term array size. There we go. Okay. So now this program is exactly the same as the previous program, which is array two .cpp. Are there any questions about this one? So why? Okay. Once again, you know, I, I demonstrated the what. Okay. Here comes the why. Why did I do this? If you compare, okay, let me let me show you both programs at the same time. Okay, so vim.o, array2, array3. Okay, so now the two programs are displayed side by side. You know, I didn't have enough space for one, but that's kind of besides the point. Array2.cpp is a lot shorter. So what is the whole point of pulling out the logic to read into an array of integers into its own subroutine in array 3.cpp. Why would I do that? Making the program longer, but it will still do exactly the same thing as before. And why would that relate to your homework assignment? Because you want to make sure that you're not reading the same thing twice. Mm, well, the first one wouldn't do that either. Array 2 is not going to read it twice. It, it will not read into the same element twice. Yep. You'll need to Right. If I have a different array of integers to read into, I can reuse the subroutine. I can just call that subroutine again, but with a different array. Mm -hmm. Why would that matter in your program? Because you got soup and you got word, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So that's that's all good. Any questions? No questions? Okay. Let's copy array 3.cpp into array 4.cpp. So this time we're going to do something else with my array. Okay. And I'm going to do. Well, I'll do this. <clears throat> So what I'm going to do this time is I have this particular subroutine called sum int array to find out what is the summation of all the values in a particular array. Okay? Are there any questions about the, the purpose of this subroutine? Okay. I have the same kind of uh, parameters because one tells me you know what array we're dealing with here, and the other one tells me how many elements are supposed to be in this array. There's one little difference here that I can make. I can make this const. Why can I make this const? As opposed to the other one, I cannot make it const, but this one can. 
What is the purpose of read int array? What is the purpose of that function? Looking at the code, what is it, what does it do? It reads into the array, right? So if the elements of the array are const, that means I cannot change them. But what is the purpose of sum int array just by the name of the subroutine? It computes the summation, right? You know, the summation of all the all the values in the array. Would that change the values of the array, elements of the array? It's not supposed to, right? You just to compute the sum doesn't need to change anything. So that's why I can put a const here. Okay, so now I need the same thing, int i, but I also in uh, I need a summation or the sum variable sum, and now I can say for sum gets zero because you know the initial sum is zero. Um, i is initialized to zero as well because that's the index of the first element. i is less than n plus plus i. And what I need to do in here inside for each iteration is instead of scan f into a particular element in int array, I'm just going to add the value of an element of int array to sum. And, and when everything is done, I'm going to return sum as my answer. So that will basically add up all the. Yep, go ahead. Well, where you wrote the current for loop, it's alright to write sum is equal to zero, comma. You yeah. don't have to put a semicolon. Well, <laughs> that's a good question, okay? But it also is indicative that you might have forgotten some of the concepts that we have learned before. The construct of the four is inside the parentheses. We have three parts oh, separated by a semi by semicolons. Yeah. Okay, but I, I I do want to kind of go through this because I'm pretty sure some people have forgotten this. Everything that I have highlighted here is a single expression. Okay, because a comma is an operator in C and C plus plus. So this is a comma separated expression but nonetheless it is a single expression that has two parts and each part is its own expression too. So why did you do that? Is there a reason or can you just do it either way and put um, a semicolon in between sum equals zero mm -hmm. and i equals zero? No you cannot. If you change this comma to a semicolon that will make i equals to zero or the assignment of zero to i the condition of the loop. But it will also be a syntax error because now you have four parts separated by semicolons. Okay. So this will be a syntax error. Okay, well let's try to do this, okay? I like to see what the compiler has to say when we have syntax errors. Okay, so I'm gonna intentionally put in a syntax error here by putting a semicolon where a comma is supposed to go. Okay? I'm suspecting the compiler will complain there's one too many semicolons. Because too, it, it's too many only parameters? sorry. Too many parameters, basically. No, they're not parameters. There, there are supposed to be oh, three okay. expressions within the parentheses, but now we have four expressions. Okay. So well, but it doesn't hurt because I know what the problem is. It is always good to know what inject the problem and see what the compiler has to say about it. Okay. So we'll go ahead and accept, do exactly that, and it complains. Well, it actually kind of makes sense. It says expected close parenthesis before the semicolon token. In other words, it's expecting a close parenthesis here, which makes sense, right? Because it's only supposed to see two semicolons within the parentheses. And this is the end of, you know, of the third expression, and that's where the close parenthesis is supposed to be. So when you guys write code and you see this message, you kind of know what it means. All right, so let's go back and fix that first. We're turning this into a comma because now the first entire first part becomes a, se a comma separated expression. This is my condition to stay in the loop. This is my post operation. Yep. So uh, in the for uh, conditions, you could basically do any assigning of variables in there, which is more more commas, right? Yes, you can have more commas and more initializations. Yes. Well, okay, I'll put it this way: but, uh, you can you can have one expression here, 
whatever expression. It can be an expression that makes no sense. It can be a comma separated expression that can do a whole lot of initialization. It's just one expression. Okay. Any questions? No questions. All right. If there are no questions, we'll test this program and see whether it works or not. Okay. So this is array four. Oh, oh, forgot about the dash g. This is the program. I'm going to put a breakpoint on line 31, you know, because I'm fairly confident it is working. Oh, I forgot one kind of important thing. I forgot to call the subroutine, but that's okay. I can call that in GDB itself. So I'm going to run the program, and I forgot to specify the uh, redirection. So this way, I this time I actually have to type in the five numbers. Okay, I just type in the five numbers. Uh, print in this case array and those are the five numbers that, that I just typed in so everything is still good but do I have to get out of GDB fix the program call the summation subroutine to just to check whether it works or not the answer is no I, can, I don't have to do that because I can do something like this I can say print sum int array and then I can now specify array as the first parameter and specify five as the second parameter Press the enter key and it tells me the sum of those five numbers is 166. Well, is it really 166? Yeah, nobody cares. <laughs> I'll, I'll just check one digit, okay? Six plus one is seven, seven plus zero is seven, seven plus four is 11, 11 minus five is six. So the least significant digit checks out. I'm suspecting that's you know, working. Okay, what, what can I do here to check the actual result here? What about this? Would that work? Yeah. That's why I like GDB. <laughs> you don't need a separate calculator because GDB is a fancy calculator all by itself. Is that okay so far? Okay. So what else can I show you guys related to the homework assignment? I think you have all the basic tools to do it already. Okay. <coughs> Any questions? Yep. Uh, is there a way to use scan F to uh, uh, for example, if you is there a way to use scan F for it to search for a scan F cannot search. search, huh? Scan F cannot search. Okay. So you have to write your own code to search. Oh, with like conditions there. Yeah. yeah, there's not a whole lot of shortcuts here. So we can't use any library functions from C to do the search. It may not work the way you want it because if you use a a string search that is already in C and C++, it only returns the index of the first occurrence of something, which may be used already. So you might need your own logic regardless. Because you need to keep track of which letter has been used already. In other words, you know, you're fishing your alphabet soup, right? You're fishing it and look for those letters that, to make up a particular word. But once you fish out a particular letter from the alphabet soup, it is no longer in the soup. You cannot reuse it. So that's the whole idea. So somehow you have to keep track of which letter is still in the soup. There are several ways to do it. Okay? There's a clumsy way to do it. There's a not so clumsy way to do it. There's a way where you have to declare a local variable that turns out to be an array so you can keep track of which one is used and which one is not. Um, I think regardless, you have to kind of do it, you know, in that way because you're not supposed to change the string itself. But one thing is given to you is you have up to 255 characters per string, not counting the null terminator itself. So that gives you a maximum number of characters that you can you have to declare. Yep. Uh, do I need two arrays? You need at least two. 
<laughs> one for soup, one for word, but then the subroutine itself may need some additional ones. Okay? Well, from that question, I think it is important to point out one thing in array 4. When you look at the definition of sum int array, does it declare its own array? The answer is no. Very good. Okay, that is the correct answer. It does not declare its own array. But hold on a second here. What about int array? Isn't that an array? Yeah, that's an array. But who owns that array? What's that? Who owns that array? Who owns the array that some int array is going to process? I don't believe a person owns it. But well, in this case, you know, if when you look at the entire program, you know, who is going to be the owner of that particular array? It's main. <laughs> that is correct. Because only in main that we declare the array called array. Okay? And this is the time when you see this line. Okay, let me turn on the line number so I can refer to the line numbers. Line 28 of this entire program. Line 28 is the only line that declares the array as a variable. In other words, this is the only place where it reserves the space in memory for that entire array. Yep. Does that mean arrays are considered local? Mm, no. Okay, that's a good question. Okay. So let me, I, I can answer that question. Let me hold on to that one and see if this question relates. Yep. Oh, uh, I was just thinking um, with the const uh, um, array size. Yeah, mm -hmm. with the const in array size, because that's a higher scope than the function that you're calling, could you just refer to constant array size in main? Sorry, I'm like spacing on back. Even this one here? No, yeah. because it's, it's still local to main. Okay. So because yeah. it's still a local variable, so the scope of array size is only this portion of the entire program. Okay, gotcha. Yep. Can you, uh, for the sake of completion, could you call, uh, put right in main to the call for some int array? Say again? Can you, can you write in main uh, to uh, call? Yeah, you can. Sure. Just, to see what, just to see what the parameter passes would look like. It will be the same as line 30. Right? It'll be that. OK, but getting back to your question, OK? So what is happening to array? Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, so in my previous class, I was taught to declare constants as global variables. Is that like a good practice? Unless there is a good reason to make it, OK? <clears throat> in other words, if a particular symbolic constant, like pi, OK, that makes sense for it to be a global const definition because you know pi does not change depending on which subroutine you're dealing with but on the other hand array size may not be a good idea because in your entire program you might have different arrays and they may demand different sizes so you may, it may not make a whole lot of sense to make array size to be a global constant definition so are you, are you seeing the difference yeah. between array size and pi? Because pi, e, they are those kinds of constants, they're universal. But on the other hand, this particular constant is only used to control that particular array. And that's why I want it to be localized and just being in main itself. OK, but getting back to your question, OK, what are we doing with array? So the key concept that you're asking is what are we doing with the variable that is declared on line 28, and we are referring to it on line 30. Okay, so that's the linkage, right? Because this is how read int array associates the, the, the variable array from main to its own parameter called int array. So what happens is it is passing the address. Okay? So array of main is an array of exactly five integers. But just like any other variable, it has an address. Without using the ampersand, 
if you just refer to the name of an array, it is automatically passed using its address. Okay. Now, for those of you who say, but I, don't, I just don't feel comfortable doing this because you know, it doesn't seem like it's passing the address off, fine, do it. It doesn't make any difference, okay? So we'll go ahead and just do this because I am, I just want to illustrate how this is going to compile just fine because it, it really is the same meaning. Or not. <laughs> what is it complaining about? Cannot convert int asterisk 5 to int asterisk for argument 1. Okay, array is All right, so cannot take the address of an array. Okay, fine. Maybe it has to do with C++ versus C. I'll just do one experiment. Just hang on a second here. Changing the extension and also changing the compiler to just GCC and not G++ and it's, it gives me the same message. Has an argument one from incompatible pointer type and expected const int asterisk, I'm reading this part here, expected const int asterisk but argument is of type that. Yeah. Okay, so you cannot do this. You cannot take the address of an array and pass it. It means something different. So with an array, when you pass an array, it is already passing the address automatically. All right. Any other questions? Yep, go ahead. Another question. I think we always remember correctly is when you're trying to pass the array itself, it, it is sec expects a pointer in the form of the element, but it just gets the array itself, which sees stores as just the lead address for the array. Uh, so we can take off the ampersand of just giving the address for this first uh, element of the array. When you, when there's no way to pass an array by value in C and C++. So whenever you specify an array as a parameter, it is always passed, passing its address of and not passing the actual value. You mean I'm trying to remember something from like years ago? <laughs> yep, yep. This is one of the things about C++ is everything else can be passed by value except for arrays. Arrays can only be passed by the address itself. Cannot be passed by value. Arrays, uh, I guess, under better terms, the rules of C considered pointers to how they're treated. A pointer is automatically, can also be considered as an array. Okay, one more thing that I want to illustrate. Just one more thing and then we are done with today's lecture. And obviously, I want you guys to get started on this one as early as possible because you know, then on Wednesday you have a chance to ask questions. Okay, so I'm going to GDB this one more time. This is the program, and this time I'm, I'm, I will break on line 19 inside the subroutine read int array. So I'm, I'm putting a breakpoint right here, and the whole point is I want to show you what int array is, and I will put another breakpoint on line 30, B30. Run the program, I'm on line 30 right now. I say print array, okay, and I say print the address of array. And the address of array, just kind of make a mental note of this, it ends with C8, okay? And then I continue execution into the subroutine. And you can also see int array as a parameter. What does it look like? Same address. Same address, exactly. So in other words, we are not passing the array by value. It is really the same thing as array in main. So if you make changes to this parameter or what int array is pointing to, you will be make cha making changes to the local variable array in main. Okay, any questions? 
So let me set off set a target for you guys to to meet on Wednesday. Okay. So on Wednesday, I want you guys to be able to read from standard input file the two lines of text into two different arrays in main. So just call one soup. You know, you can have up to two hundred fifty six characters all together because you have 255 characters excluding the null terminator but you need one more character for the null terminator at the end okay so i want you guys to at least get that part done on wednesday then on wednesday you, if you guys want to ask questions about the matching part then we can talk about the matching part but the first part is read everything in and because of gdb you can actually see you know what the array of character looks like using gdb print Okay. Is that okay so far? Okay. Use the sample programs today, okay, because they are helpful to illustrate, you know, what you have to do with your own program. All right. Okay. So I'm going to stop the recorder, get it uploaded, and you guys can. We'll. I will see you guys on Wednesday.